we'll be letting it go later onto our uh, our Vimeo channel. But um, yeah, I just I, I see I see participants continuing to come in, and I'm just I'm really grateful of that in this moment. And so my name is Keisha Nicole Knight. Um, I am the co founder of Sentient Art Film and also right now the director of Sentient Art Film. And um, with Abby's son, we actually curated um, this panel, My Sight is Lined with Visions Together. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to kind of take a little moment at the beginning of this of this panel to talk about um, yeah just to kind of position and like set the stakes for me and and what we're you know what we're trying to do here and and how it, it actually means so much that you all can make space for this in this moment um this this really intense moment for for all of us um and so i just wanted to kind of start by saying that um i think you know this this series is programmed around a certain moment and a certain group of filmmakers in time um, the 1990s Asian American filmmaking scene, but yet it's also, you know, we can think about like the strategies and the, 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 the ways in which we're pushing boundaries, like working in across these boxes that are trying to be put around us. And that kind of ability to work through like a small scale and also a broader scale this ability to think at different scales at one time to me is a really important thing that we can actually do together in this moment and for me it's one of the reasons and the reason that having this conversation right now is is actually really important and deeply political and the fact that you know you've all been able to make space to be here, John and Ria, Abby, and all of the participants um, that we can kind of think through this moment um, together is just really, I think it's really powerful. Um, I also, um, I wanted to take a moment um, before we start, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll bear with me on this. I wanted to take a moment um, actually a minute that we could kind of sit together, um, kind of honor each other being here and um, honor the moment that we're in and the pause that we've taken to kind of be here together. And I just also wanna say the names of uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. And also just knowing that in saying those names, there are thousands of names that haven't been said, victims of state violence both in the US and internationally. Um, and I just thought that we could just sit uh, for a minute just together to try to make this non-place of Zoom a place before we start our, our conversation today. Um, so I'm gonna just sit here with you for a minute and I'll, I'll let you know when it's over. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, let's get started. Let's rock and roll, yeah? Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, it feels very strange, participants, that 
you're all here and I, we can't see you. Neither John, Rhea, nor I can see you, but I see that you're here in the chat and we're so blessed to have you here. Um, I just wanna let you know that in, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. And it's really like, what will make this Q&A is for you to put forth your questions. And so you can put them in that box down there. We're gonna start off with a kind of some introductions and some my initial questions. But if you can just put your questions there in the Q&A box, we're not really gonna look at the chat. Um, and also in the Q&A, you can put it in anonymously or you can put it in with your name. And if you like the question that's being asked, you can actually also do a thumbs up and that will raise the question to the top. So um, hopefully we can have an engaged conversation that's kind of focused around, you know, what you're interested in hearing with um, John and Rhea. So um, I know that John, neither John nor Rhea actually need introduction, but I'm gonna do a little, a little baby introduction just to kind of situate us all together and then um, we'll, we'll move on. But um, so Rhea, Rhea Tajiri is um, the director of Strawberry Fields, which is a part of this series. And she also offered Little Murders and Obits to us, which is from 1998, which is in the vault of this series. And Rhea is a Philadelphia-based filmmaker and artist who has written and directed a, an eclectic body of work, including History and Memory um, for Akiko and Takashige. And, and the recent multi-site installation, Wata Ridori, Birds of Passage. And Rhea is currently an associate professor in the Film and Media Arts Department of Temple University, and she teaches documentary production there. So Rhea, thank you for being here and thank you for making the space to come. Um, and then we also, we also have John Moritsugu, who's coming to us from Honolulu. And um, John's been making films since 1985. And his film, Mommy, Mommy, Where's My Brain from 1986 is in the vault in this series. And then he also directed what he calls his PBS meltdown, Terminal USA from 1993, which is also part of the series. And um, John has directed films <clears throat> that Girish Shambhu, who was supposed to be a part of the series, but couldn't make it today, but he calls a punk hardcore ethos. So like mod fuck explosion, fame horror, and scum rock. And John has worked with his wife and leading lady, Amy Davis, for 20 years, who was the writer of scum rock and pig death machine. And they're currently in post-production on John's eighth feature, uh, Numbskull Revolution. So that's happening right now. Um, so that's a, that's a brief, capsule. Um, but so we wanted to start um, outside of those kind of traditional introductions. Um, John, you don't have your, you don't have your image background. So we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but we'll start with, <laughs> yeah. we, we, had, we had some kind of technical difficulties, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm here. I'm you're here. here, you made it, it's happening. Uh, <laughs> This is awesome. Yeah, um, but we'll start with we'll start with Ria. Um, and what one of the things we asked um, was that uh, you know there was uh, an image in the background that could kind of speak to inspirations or things that are animating um, the filmmakers' interests in film and and what's inspiring them. So Ria, maybe you could you could kind of speak to us a little bit about this image that's behind you and and why you chose it for today. Sure. Um, so the image is from um, the artist and filmmaker Colleen Smith. And it's a, uh, here, I'll just duck down so you can see it. <laughs> um, it's an image from um, her, a film from 2017. It's actually part of an installation as well. Uh, and um, the film is called Sojourner. And it was filmed uh, in the desert uh, in, at Noah. Purifoy, the artist Noah Purifoy's um, kind of like museum. And um, I, it, it is based on an iconic photograph taken by the photographer Billy May for 1966 Life magazine, which actually had uh, a grouping of men. And, and then, you know, in this case, this is a grouping of women. Uh, to me, it's an image of solidarity. So I, I, I find this film really empowering to watch. It's a 
kind of a procession led by these women and they're holding these banners um that say things like us uh, what is it sky oh uh wait a second if i wrote it down sky will be sky um sorry I, I, but anyway uh and it's based on the writings of the combahee Com river collective which is a, a black feminist collective and i think uh colleen was interested in um <coughs> communities of utopia <coughs> so it had influenced this body of work, and this was just one of the, the images from that. I really love this image, and I love the film, so that's why it's here today. <laughs> it's <inspiring. I> <laughs> and John, for, um, <laughs> for you, you, you had an image that I have yeah. sitting on my computer. Uh that no one can see but you and i know what it was but it can you yeah, can we you do. It's, yeah it's you, and, you and i know it's our <laughs> secret can you can you explain maybe to the to the participants uh, what it all was? right all right absolutely it, <laughs> all right so my image is it, it's it's like a blotchy mass of color different colors and it's like one of those like doppler atmospheric forecasts you know you're, you're on the weather channel on a weather station and you see you know the weather coming in and they represent it with colors and different colors representing intensities and mildness and calm things going on but my, my weather atmospheric map had to do with ozone and just pollution and pollutants moving in so it's beautiful lots of colors but sort of showed it basically would it, it was a backdrop that enveloped me in this haze uh, represented me being surrounded by all this pollution ozone all this stuff and yeah for me i just you know was thinking abstract but just thinking about where we are right now and it, it sort of does seem like you know as a country as individuals as a, a world we're enveloped by a lot of pollution a lot of haze right now and i just you know wanted to put that out there not in a negative way not in a pessimistic way but just in a way that as much as we see bad weather coming in, bad weather goes out, but it changes. And uh, so that was my mm -hmm. representation, really abstract, sort of poetic, nothing concrete, but just this idea of this flux, this change being around us. And, you know, sometimes it does get really, really bad. Sometimes it gets really harsh, but, you know, again, it's, it's in flux. Mm. Flux, solidarity. Yeah, these are and, uh, optimism for a sunnier day with better air, better, more sunshine, less storm, storm clouds. You know, radical optimism. This is this is Absolutely. yeah. yeah this I've is gotta hang that. <laughs> um, I um I wanted to I I, I wanted to start. Um, I have I have I have a, a quite a few questions for for you all, but. I wanted to start with this um, this idea of refusal. Um, there seems like there's there's something in in both of your works, um, and maybe starting starting with you, John. This idea of refusal of you know boxes of of different like categories that you're trying to be forced into but also particularly also for you it seems like a finance right like a refusal yeah. of kind of working into those circuits and i just was wondering if yeah. you know maybe starting with you john and moving on to urea like if you could talk a little bit about that is that something that is just something that kind of was just part of your dna that happened or is it something that you actively had to like work for because I'm, I'm really thinking about in terms of like it's not easy right like to, to to really say no to something that is trying to kind of constrict you and and it takes a lot of psychic emotional collective space and i'm just kind of wondering yeah. if you could like speak around that and and in your process with that oh absolutely i mean when when i started making movies i came from a I, I don't know, a background of, you know, growing up in Honolulu, going to college on the East Coast, but like really being part of like this underground music and cultural scene. And uh, so when I started making movies, it, it really wasn't with the intent of making Hollywood movies or getting huge financing with megastars. I, I you know, use this, I, I wanted to make movies to express myself. And 
there were there were weren't that many people out there. The, you know, when I started out, the, the phrase independent film didn't even exist. Uh, no one had a digital camcorder or an iPhone. Uh, you really had to sort of grab that Hollywood mode of production, Hollywood equipment, but then sort of do it really cheaply and make your own movies. So, you know, from the start, I, I saw, saw myself as like a, making movies as a political act, not necessarily the subject matter of the content, but just the way the movies were made the way they're financed, distributed, my choice of who was going to star in the movies, the music, the soundtracks. I've always sort of seen, a, for me at least, movie making is an act of defiance against the status quo, the industry, the uh, definition of like the way movies should be made. Uh, that's where I got my start. And uh, the movie that you're streaming, Terminal USA, it's my first movie with the overt deep Asian American content. All the actors pretty much are Asian American. It deals with racism, being Asian American in America. And uh, this also, to me, was a, act, a political act. Uh, when I, I had never approached the subject matter, but when I started it, I actually got a lot of feedback and input from people saying, hey, this isn't, this isn't what you should be doing, especially with the budget, especially with PBS money. This isn't proper Asian American expression. And again, I said, well, I'm going to do it my way. Burned a lot of bridges, made, made some enemies, but had to express, I guess, my view of what it was like being Asian American and growing up Asian American in America. So yeah, for me, uh, filmmaking, it's number one been about self-expression, putting ideas, messages out into the world, which I think are positive, which I think are important ideas and messages I'm hoping will shake up the world a little bit, but I also just uh, have looked at filmmaking as a way of uh, sort of creating a, I guess, a different way of expression, a, a mode that's sort of outside of the norm. So, yeah, as far as what you're saying about, you know, being different, thinking outside the box, breaking stereotypes and molds, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you, and I think, for me at least, that is my way of expressing myself, you know? Mm, and if I can, if I can just like follow up before we, we get Rhea's take on this, um, how has that, I mean, when you say burn bridges, like from personal yeah. experience, I know that once bridges are burned, they're burned, right? So how yeah. like, yeah, like there's, that, that's a real, <laughs> that's a real kind of like, you know, you, you're kind of almost curating a certain path for yourself yeah. through that. And I'm wondering how uh -huh. that's affected the way you approach your work after Terminal USA, for example. Like, have you, I know that there's that quote from you, you know, that kind of iconic quote that's like, this is the worst way to make a film, right? With all this money uh -huh. and all these people looking over you. Yeah. And, and just in terms of that defiance, um, like, how did that shape the way you you looked at filmmaking afterward? You know, you know I honestly, uh, I think it, it's taken decades for me to look back and realize, wow, I was, I was uncool. I was a dick about things, honestly. <laughs> uh, like, like, the biggest bridge I, I burned with Terminal USA was uh, there's a really big executive producer involved. I was working with him, and... Uh, you know, he went on to, to run Focus Features, so he was in charge of a billion dollars worth of, you know, content. And uh, I refused to see it as a collaborative project. I, and so I basically told him to screw off, and uh, it got really ugly. And uh, I was, in my mind back then in 1993, I was sticking by my guns. I was a guy trying to hold on to my dignity and sanity. But I, I really wasn't looking at our, my filmmaking as a collaborative process where, I should have been listening to other people, collaborating with them, being open to their ideas, even if they're different from mine. And so that was a huge bridge I burned. And it took me years to realize, wow, you know, that wasn't so cool, not only uh, career-wise, but just as, you know, just in terms of making art and collaborating, I was a really uncool collaborator. I wasn't really compassionate. I think it's really funny. I wouldn't redo it. I had my reasons for burning this bridge, but uh, you know, on the other hand, it, it 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 is not what to do to succeed in business. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you're right. Once you burn the bridge, you know, we've I've since made up with this producer. We can talk, but it'll never go back to the way it 
was. And uh, honestly, he he was positioning me to be the next Ang Lee, and I blew it. And so I I am now John Mortsugu, you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, like John Mortsugu is so important. Well, That's what I'm saying. John Mortsugu, yeah. Funny story. I mean, <laughs> that the thing. Maybe I grew up a little bit. I, no, I had to do some growing up. I had to do some growing up. We I feel better now. We another angle. We needed a. We needed a. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, some bridges. Work. Some bridges <laughs> need to be burned, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was part of the learning process, and I mean, I still look back to these encounters with this producer, and I laugh at them. They were absolutely hilarious. It, this would be a great movie, you know, uh, some of these scenes. But, you know. Now, where I am right now, sitting where I am, I, I would have done things totally differently. And, uh, you know, growth, change. Again, it's like my weird ozone weather Doppler backdrop that we're imagining. It's all about flux and change, including change within. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to evolve and every day be a different person, hopefully be a better person. And mm. looking back, you know, to this project over 25 years ago, I'm like, wow, I can't believe some of the stuff I did. and a little bit embarrassed, laughing a lot, but, you know, hope not to repeat these things. <laughs> hope not to repeat the behavior. Wonderful, yeah. Um, so, Rhea, for you, it seems like the, the path has been a little bit, a little bit different, yeah? And the, the ways in which you've kind of refused the boxes, um, has been has been There's a lot of things that I related to in what John said. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting though because I can't. You know, I watched Terminal U.S. I haven't seen it in a million years, and okay. I somebody had said to me a decade ago, you know, there's a lot, actually a lot of weird similarities between these two stories. They're just really different sides of the spectrum. But I I saw that today, and I was just laughing to myself because obviously, like you know, our aesthetics and all our, you know, sort of references are completely different, but there's a lot of things that land in the same place. And I think we were trying to look at, you know, break apart this idea of model minority and stereotypes and dysfunctional family, right? And look at that. <clears throat> and then, you know, in my case, it was about, you know, rebellion, the road trip. Um, but anyway, yeah, there, there's that, that's interesting. And a refusal is an interesting, yeah, that's a really interesting word. Um, and I would say that, uh, yeah, at a lot of steps and a lot of stages, uh, uh, I've, I feel that, you know, whereas in some cases it might have been easy to comply or assimilate, there's other choices that I've made that have been more along the ba basis of, you know, re refusal, not wanting to um, go a certain way. Um, and I, I don't know, it was interesting too because, um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I went to art school. I'm from Chicago. I went to arts. I, my family's, you know, third generation. Um, we grew up in Chicago. Um, I come from a family of, you know, uh, my uncle is a sculptor. Uh, my, uh, my other uncle is a writer. And, you know, um, my siblings are all in the arts and stuff. So we, we have this kind of art thing going on in our family. Um, but uh, yeah, my family, I, we ended up in California, we ended up in LA. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I guess I was kind of blown away when I first saw art film for the first time, because it was like, oh yeah, this is, this means that art does not have to be these kind of, um, mainstream, you know, Hollywood stories at which actually, you know, always fall, fell flat, right? And, and what, what could, you know, could, I, could we break that open? Could we break that apart? What would happen? What if we did things that didn't seem linear or didn't seem logical or seemed expression, you know, had expression in them? What if, um, you know, for me, of course, it was about, you know, having women and having main characters that were pushing against um, the constrictions of, you know, and, and breaking rules. So I don't know, that was my, when I think about that. Um, and the funny thing is that like also though, that, that both John and I were maybe in that same uh, year where um, PBS or ITVS came in and um, 
had this open call for uh, for um, their first or second round of funding, I think. And Shu Li also, Shu Li Chang, who did Fresh Kill. Uh, I think we were all in this first or second year of funding, and we all did these really whacked out things that they did not program because they couldn't, they couldn't figure out what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah we kind of like when our it was kind of great when you know when you think about it i mean it was um probably on you know they pro i think that the everything changed pretty fast over there um once they realized they had a that made it a bunch of films that couldn't be programmed but mm. you know uh went on to have these other lives in other places so that, i don't know that was kind of amazing um yeah mm. Yeah. No, interesting. I am. Um, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move forward with another another question. But also, I just. I'm really. We have. We have twenty participants here with us today, and I. We really, really, really want your questions. Like I think John and Rhea and I can continue to to speak for a while, and we're happy to do that. But also, please like. Even if it seems like a stupid question, please just put it in the Q and A, and we'd love to love to work with it and answer it and and think through it with you. Um, but um, I was wondering, Ria, um, why? I mean, what were the what were the the politics of the moment that you were actually thinking thinking through? Was there something that was in in your head? specifically like what, what what were you kind of negotiating at the time that you made strawberry fields right um yeah okay so uh <laughs> i'm trying to remember because <laughs> there's a lot you know a little bit scrambled with the timelines but um you know i actually think i had initially applied Okay, so I, I was like actually doing video art and I did this film, a short film called History and Memory. And it's about, you know, the questions of official history, right? Versus, um, you know, a sort of like public history versus private memory and, and specifically focusing on incarceration of Japanese Americans. And, um, and then, you know, after that film, um, I wanted to do, I was thinking, or after the video, it was a video, I actually was thinking of like trying to make a story, a narrative story as a way of like also thinking about like, you know, narrative forms and wanting to like have a, a, a film that could go out into like, could this film, could a film about a Japanese American woman play in a theater right that was the question and all these things were starting to shift and so that was a big you know moment i i remember applying for itvs and i uh, shu lee um i shu lee this is actually in this film quarterly thing that abby worked on but shu lee had started this office and we were sharing office with other filmmakers and then uh shu lee goes well don't make it a short make it a feature because you know, this is the moment to go out and, you know, make big, make, you know, big larger stories that can have this larger audience, you know, let's do it. So she kind of pushed me. Um, anyway, uh, that was kind of, and I think also we were building these communities of filmmakers of color at that point and artists of color, we were all talking to each other and it really felt very attainable, which it hadn't been before, you know. <clears throat> I think when I was in uh, art school, I would sort of go to film classes, but it really felt like it was very male dominated. It felt like it wasn't something that would, it was, it felt like it was something that was unattainable at that point. And now it seemed like it was possible. And with this community and cohort, like it was possible to put that kind of work out there and create that, that kind of a film. So, yeah. Hmm. Those were kind of the things. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, I was actually, it's funny, uh, you said politics of the time, and I was telling you this the other day, Keisha, that because um, we were trying to figure out, should we go ahead and do this gathering today on Zoom, considering everything that's happening right, yeah. and right now in the country around exactly. um, George Floyd and Brandon Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and 
I said that um, it, it was very both upsetting and kind of intense because in 1992 I was in a show I was set to do a show with a, a group of Japanese American artists at the Long Beach Museum of Art and I was living in New York at that time so I was getting on a plane and going to Los Angeles, but I was cut off from the news that entire day because of all these, something had happened at the airport, we had to be shifted around, and I didn't have any access to the news. And then as we were in the air, I, we were looking to land, and there was a delay in the landing, and I looked down and I saw these um, fires burning. And so I knew pretty quickly that you know, the outcome was that it <laughs> was not good. And, um, and then it was like this, you know, kind of, landing in the midst of a very similar situation. The National Guard was out, um, TV was like 24 hour live stream reality, I don't know, uh, verite. Um, so it was, um, it was like also this thing about what are we doing, you know, what is the, what is the role of art in this moment? And it's like, everybody was, but no, this is the, this is, this is actually, actually art is part of that conversation you know art is not just a separate thing art is actually can be you know part of that conversation so I don't know I'm just thinking you know free associating but that is was kind of something that was happening I remember um, during that time as well yeah, yeah. absolutely no the the idea that um, I mean there are there are all these different levels right that it's what I was talking about at the beginning about scale too, like just different scales and different kind of like even emotional and different planes that we're working on right um that are all kind of collaborating collapsing and working through these films um, um john i'm wondering we do we have we have one question from the audience but i would i want to i want to kind of uh shift over to you first before we do that and, and ask you about kind of what i mean you you were saying that film is like a political engagement for you. It's always been that yeah. for you. But I'm wondering if there was anything in particular that you were that you were working with right at that point when you were making Terminal USA, if there was something that you were working through. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I almost feel like I, I wasn't ready to deal with the uh, Asian subject matter, the Asian concept until Terminal USA. Uh, you know, I made it in 1993, but leading up to it, uh, I start surveying mainstream media and just, you know, Asian, Asian American representation in mainstream media. And I, I got really pissed off because uh, just on TV commercials, just every form of media, it seemed like Asians, Asian Americans were represented in these blatant stereotypes like uh, the good gardener, the Chinese restaurant owner making the stir fry, the guy working at the Chinese laundry. It, you know, the high GPA math student, every, almost every single representation of the Asian American was this blatant uh, stereotype. And so I, that's what I, I grabbed, uh, the anger I felt about this, the powerlessness I felt about this and said, I'm gonna, you know, I have this budget, I wanna make a movie that just deconstructs this radically, that just is a, uh, this movie is a place where I can put my anger and maybe uh, make it funny at the same time. I, I feel it's mm. always great to temper these really intense emotions with a little levity. So what I said is I'm gonna create a, uh, a television show or a movie, Terminal USA, where every Asian character radically breaks with the stereotypes we are accustomed to. So the whole cast, the whole Asian cast of Terminal USA, it's like drug dealers, drug addicts, survivalists, sex <laughs> addicts, Every sort of like off kilter, badass, weird representation stuff that we roles uh, that we've never seen Asians put into. You know, it's, I, I just wanted to blow minds with this. I sort of, uh, I, I totally got inspired by the black exploitation filmmakers of the '60s, like Van Peebles, and said, you know, uh, before we actually start the dialogue, you've got to have people coming in, kicking the door open. And I said, that's going to be me. I'm going to do mm. Asian Americans. I'm going to just throw these stereotypes out there and throw these things in your face that are going to be obnoxious, but and you might not agree with what you're seeing on the screen, but it's going to get a ride. It's going to get attention. So that's what I did with Terminal USA. And uh, I sort of saw myself as like an Asian American Spike Lee. I was like, I'm, I'm pushing forth stuff that might not be comfortable to watch, but it's going to be pushed into your face and make you see how 
off the media is, how off representation is. And so mm. that was my starting point with Terminal USA. I said, I'm going to create these aggressive, in-your-face, dysfunctional Asians, but they're going to be Asians you have never seen before in your life on a screen, on TV, in the <laughs> media, you know, in a movie. And that, that was my starting point. I said, we've got to start somewhere, so I'm going to start right here. That's what I was going to say. I actually, we actually have a question from, um, from Brian, from Brian who, um, and he's actually, this one's for you, John, and he's asking, he says, your work is sometimes tied to concepts like anarchy, especially given what is happening politically now. Where do you see your work in connection with the politics of anarchy? Man, uh... That's a good question. All right. I'll, I think as far as anarchy, I think the most, for me, the most important type of anarchy is personal anarchy. And that's almost like having that, that rebellion that we, we always, I think, look at anarchy as like a rebellion against society, against the political structure, against the status quo, against this government. I think personally, uh, the strongest anarchy is the anarchy within us where we actually rebel against maybe our constructs, our stereotypes, our ways of being. And I think, uh, you know, they always say the revolution starts right here. The revolution starts at home. It mm. starts with one person. Yes. I think before we can even hope to affect a change in another human being in a group of people in a nation, uh, it's got to all start here. And it, it's a hard thing. I mean, it, it's like what I was saying about burning bridges and maybe growing and growing and changing and being in flux is we, I think, uh, you know, as far as being an aware human being, as far as being a sentient human being, we've got to take every moment in our lives and review what we're doing, what we're thinking, and even go back 10 years, 20 years, see where we were, see if we've grown, see if we've gotten better, see if we've regressed and if we have make that change and be an anarchist and rebel against the politics within you that are fucked up. Mm. Rebel against the corruption within you that are fucked up. Rebel against the, you know, stereotypes you're holding on to that you don't even know you're holding on to. I think, so that, that's, I, you know, all my movies uh, from my very first feature, they've been about these personal struggles with these characters, these completely flawed characters, but I'm trying to throw these flawed characters in people's faces, not because I'm pointing the figure, but these are all flaws I, I have had and I still have. And I'm trying to just maybe express that, uh, hey, the, you know, what is it? The, the life that's unexamined is a wor worthless life. I'm totally misquoting this. But uh, <laughs> I think especially here and now, before we come out in judgment of others, I think we've all got to really look at ourselves. And I'm not saying, okay, that means everyone's a racist and, you know, come clean and be cool people. I'm just saying that we've, we're all human and we have these like glitches and we've got to be anarchists against the bad stuff inside of us and break free of this stuff. Mm. You know? Yeah. No. Amen. Yeah. Um, I, um, well, there's a question. Um, thank you participants who are, I can't see you. It's so sad. I, and, but thank you for all these questions. And we have another question for Ria and John. Um, and this is from Kimmy. Um, um, she's wondering, uh, Kimmy's wondering, do you feel that there is an expectation for you to make work, particularly in regards to funding, only with Asian American content? And how do you personally negotiate these expectations? How are your priorities? And um, you know, how do you feel about approaching other non-Asian American subject matter? So is there this pressure particularly with regards to funding about, you know, being in this Asian American subject matter. I, I'll, I'll, t I'll say one thing about that, which is um, I, I made a film called Lordville um, that um, wasn't necessarily specifically an Asian American film. Uh, it was set in a town that I owned a house in, and I actually I appear as the one Asian American, you know, sort of person in the in the town. Um, but I know that it was um, that some of the Asian American festivals at first were hesitant to program it because it didn't seem to have Asian American content, and I remember that it was a you know I remember saying you know like that's a misreading of the film because of course. 
it is through the lens of an Asian American producer and through the perspective of an Asian American person. And it happens to be about, you know, settler colonialism, you know, and so it was a kind of a narrow reading. Um, and also that was the hardest film to actually um, fundraise for. I couldn't explain it to anybody. So I ended up just crowdsourcing and doing that. Um, but um, just, I guess some of the things that I've been interested in recently have been mostly sort of circling around things that have to do with Asian American topics or family stuff. So I don't know, like, um, uh, I don't know that, um, you know, I'm kind of interested in um, looking at other venues because film is just so um, long and um, difficult. And I, I kind of, I, I kind of getting into more towards installation and interested in installation. And so, um, mm. that's, yeah. This is actually a question that came up from, um, from Douglas, from Douglas Ishii. Um, he was wondering, you know, it, the question is if the feature film offers its possibilities for greater audiences in the, in the 1990s, and this is for and this is for both of you. Um, did your perspective on the idea of the feature change after you've made it? And for Ria, it seems like the answer is yes, right? That the the feature film is maybe not it's it's a medium for some kind of expression, but maybe not the only one that you're interested in using. Well, it's funny because, you know, John told that story about <laughs> the horror show of making that feature and um, having, you know, I, I mean, I think I experienced something similar and I don't want to speak for, oh, I'll, I guess it'll come up, but, you know, I mean, it, it is a really very um, top heavy structure, right, to make a you know, have suddenly have money and to work with producers and levels of all this level of, of, you know, sort of upper level management, right? And you're just trying to go and, you know, grab your camera and go shoot something. And it's like, no, you know, the first AD and that this, and you know, just like not being used to that structure and not sure, not certain afterwards, whether that structure was really something um, I could even, you know, I just have no interest in, um, and, and, you know, similarly had all sorts of meltdowns and drama and, you know, just on and on and on crazy, uh, conversations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or, you know, the, um, yeah. The, I mean, but John, I mean, John seems like, it seems like John, you've been, but, Pretty committed. And so the answer to the question, though, I think it says, yeah. did, if the feature film offered possibilities for for greater audiences in the '90s, did did my perspective change? Yeah. You no, know, I don't think that that was. So in the '90s, I don't know, John. Maybe you can say something about this, but um, it 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 was actually that that period. I don't know when Terminal came out, but right at my film came out a little later. I, I came out in '97, '98. And at yeah, that point, yeah. it was like there was this transition into, you know, that that phrase was coined, independent film, right? And these big indie yeah. players came out. So that whole freedom really changed. And mm. so the kinds of films that we were making, maybe, I don't know, you know, maybe we had a harder time to compete with like more studio backed indie films and that whole marketing and distribution thing that, you know, and the clear cut like designation of like that is niche we don't want to touch it this is you know we can do this because that was what my film was coined as a niche film mm -hmm. and um anyway i don't know what your experience was like and what your timing was like either but yeah maybe you can say something john about that i don't know all right well you know terminal usa came out in 1993 and yeah it was sort of at the beginning of the whole independent feature movement and you know, I feel really lucky that I was able to make a, a bunch of features in the 90s, independent features. Uh, I think it was the uh, sort of the uh, the hot, cool way to present an idea was an independent film. It was sort of the cliche, but that was almost like the perfect container for an idea. It was mm. the independent movie, an hour and a half of this grand vision, which people would actually have to go to a movie theater and watch. Uh, I don't know, it just seems like every decade has like its perfect container for ideas. Right now, the perfect idea, a perfect container might be a, 
a container that's about 27 minutes long that's episodic that streamed on TV. It seems like that's where all the work is. The energy is in streaming. It's in Netflix. It's in Amazon. It's in these little episodic TV shows. Maybe five years ago, the perfect container was something like the uh, 25 second YouTube clip. I don't know. It seems like yeah. uh, just as a society, as a world, we go through this these trends or the zeitgeist of what is the perfect container mm -hmm. for presenting an idea to the world. And uh, I honestly feel we're going to get back to the movies. I mean, movies were huge in the 30s. They were huge in the 50s. They were always huge, but they've gone through ups and downs. I am, I, so I'm holding on to hope that the, the idea of an independent film or a film, an hour and a half experience that's completely immersive, where you aren't sitting in a lift living room, but you're in a movie theater, I do think and hope that this will come back sometime soon. Uh, I personally love the container of the independent film. I like the idea of an hour and a half to present this one idea, these characters, this plot, mm. this narrative. Uh, but again, it's all sort of moot. It's all just sort of like packaging. And I think ultimately what it gets down to is the idea within the package. And whether it's a I don't know, a transcendent independent movie or a transcendent 20 second video. I think it gets down to what is the idea there? Is there a heart there? What is it trying to say? And, you know, is this affecting people in the right way? Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like you, you've been pretty consistent about the, the movie as the container, yeah. right? That's something that yeah. you've kind of been working through from project to project yeah. to project. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I also, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm working on a book right now. So Kaya Press, Asian American, Asian Press is going to publish it later this year. But my, my other perfect container is the book. Mm. I, I've always felt that the book, you know, it goes through ups and downs. The book is another perfect container. And hey, I'm going to put it out there, the vinyl record, 33 and a half, <laughs> 33 and a third RPM, LP. Another perfect container, more perfect than the CD or the MP3 file. I mean, these are my perfect containers. I'm old school, I'm old, but you know, we'll them out there. I love it, and it'll all come back. I love the idea, this cyclical, like, yeah. it'll come back around. I love yeah. it. I think it's true. I actually, I completely agree with you. Um, I actually have, we have a question from um, Chris Yogi here, um, and he, he would like to ask, um, you know, if you could, if both, this is a question for both of you, um, if you could speak a little bit to the current state of API cinema and, um, you know, if, if like what your engagement is with it at all, you know, where, where you are in terms of engaging with that and where you'd like to kind of see it go if you have, I don't know if you have any thoughts or thoughts or ideas about that. Uh, what, what type of cinema is this? Like Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander okay. cinema. Yeah. Man. Uh because you know we see all this we see all this kind of you know a lot of hyper you know kind of temple movies about you know with with asian representation now and we yeah. see a lot of also indie films um out, you know so i just kind of wonder where you where what your engagement yeah. is with the with the scene i i think i think this type of rep representation has to get way more radical i mean it, it it's sort of weird on the surface it seems like society has really moved forward. Like you have these hipster cafes with the pour over coffee, everyone's eating organic. We have avocado toast. People are going keto and taking care of their health and CrossFit and, you know, like a lot of power for uh, sexual identity, for trans, for, you know, there, there's a lot of like the, the, the women's movement has really moved forward. And, in certain ways, our society has just gotten so much better than 25 years ago when Terminal USA came out. And as we're seeing right now, at this moment, maybe it hasn't. So that's where I'm just thinking that it's not the time to get complacent and to kick back and say, hey, man, as an Asian American, as an Asian Pacific Islander, hey, man, it's all chill. Things are cool for me. It, I, I, I think it's a time to really examine and see really what has changed and what hasn't changed in the world. And if you see stuff that's an injustice, if you see stuff that's really pissing you off, say something about it, make a movie about it, do some media, just, just like be active. Uh, I, I think it's really a strange time right now. And uh, it, you know, I've, on certain levels, the world feels, you know, I just even a few weeks ago, despite COVID-19, the world felt better in certain ways was it really better or has it gotten worse?
course. So uh, really, I, I think we're at a more crucial stage in the 90s and the 80s, even in the 80s was, and the 90s was when I felt as an Asian American, I have to say stuff. That's why I'm Eternal USA, but I feel it's even more crucial right now. We have to keep the momentum going, keep, keep the thoughts, good thoughts out there and keep pushing the ideas and getting rid of these stereotypes and just really confronting them and really trying to erase them because they are still out there, just the insanely inept, offensive, messed up representations in the media, the way language is used, stuff like that. I, I think more than anything else, now's the time to really get radical with the work and really mm. say something, say something important. Now's the time. Yeah. Ria, are you, are you on the same? Yeah, I, the same I agree with that. I think one of the things that I like about the, the program is that there's, there's an, uh, kind of, um, look back and assembling of, and not films that are necessarily even identified by a certain genre. Like there's doc, there's experimental, there's narrative. And I think in that, I mean, looking at that, there's a kind of way to create an excitement and a different viewpoint, right? Like, I feel like sometimes with the way that funding structures go, it dictates too much like, okay, you're a documentary, you go over here, you're, you're doing fiction, you go over here, you're, you know, doing this art thing, you, you go over here. And I, I would like to see kind of like what you're saying, you know, like both a kind of more radical kind of political um, kind of cross pollination between the forms and not having to be, you know, to ha having to be tied to those constrictions and for the forms to open up and overlap more and to there to be more like hybrid and, and also a more immediacy in terms of addressing issues and, um, you know, a solidarity work, you know, solid work, things where productions and films that address the solidarity, mm. solidarity, um, yeah. I'm actually, so we have a, a question from Keiko Gonzalez that I'm actually going to get to because I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I just wanted to ask you one more first and then we'll finish with um, Keiko as um, my question. And honestly, this is actually something that I kind of want to know myself in, in your work in this, in this kind of radical filmmaking, art making tradition, which to me in terms of working with Senshi and also includes like figuring out how to collectively get things circulating. Um, where do you find your source for like your psychic and emotional renewal in that, right? Because it can't always be just pouring out, right? Like it can't always be like, I'm this endless fount of creativity that just keeps giving and giving and giving it. It's just like, that's not real. So I'm just kind of wondering, just like very like nuts and bolts practical, like is there, is there any kind of, is there anything that you could point to that helps you keep going? Wow, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the good stuff in the world. It's relationships, it's love. I mean, it's my relationship with my wife. It's my love and relationship with my mom. It's uh, family stuff. It's connection to nature, to a tree, a bird flying by, I mean, as much as this movie making stuff is important, it's crucial, it's my passion. There's a lot of stuff out there that's way bigger than the movies, way bigger than me. And this is where I, I tap in, I get renewed, I get recharged. Maybe I learn some stuff, I see the big picture, but it's, it's all that, that good shit out there. Cause mm. again, right now, this day and age, it doesn't look like there's any good stuff out there. You see the smoke, you hear the screams. It, it seems hopeless and tragic and sad and angering but at the same time there there's some good stuff out there and maybe it's stuff that has nothing to do with humans you know mm. but there is stuff out there that you can tap into grab that energy grab that peace and calm and that's why i'm so lucky that i'm in honolulu because there is a lot of nature here there's the ocean and so that's where i renew my energy it's connections with you know nature other human beings these really pure good emotions love compassion mm stuff like that. that that's, that's, where I, that's where I get the juice to keep going to deal with stuff on a daily basis, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray, what about you? Um, uh, yeah, so like, I, I think uh, relationships, friendships, family, and uh, 
I think also like dealing with, well, I'm lucky enough that I teach. And so I think dealing intergenerationally with people who are younger than me, who keep me, um, you know, kind of like, like ask me questions, don't agree with me, um, challenge all the things that I assume are like, you know, and then I go, oh, well, I guess I've just assumed this, but clearly, you know, like there's a whole other way of looking at this, this mm. thing. Right? And, um, also like I think you know I'm also lucky that I have like all these nieces and nephews who are like two two layers of them so I have like this first layer and then like they have kids and so now <laughs> there's that layer <laughs> and they're all like drawing and doing weird things and so I get to like participate in that and like forget about the pressures of like oh art art is this big you know you just go and you just very directly <laughs> engage right with that so if if there's a way to be, you know, to engage younger people in your, in uh, your life or in your community, I think that is kind of amazing. You know? mm, yeah. Amazing. And um, that also, I think gives, you know, hope for re some kind of, something that's regenerative and restorative. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I, these, these new generations, uh, these younger generations are amazing. I'm on a daily basis. You know, I, I love that human contact with other humans just that brief connection even you meet someone for 20 seconds and that's it for the rest of your life but uh, <laughs> i'm constantly amazed by just the open-mindedness and compassion of these people in their 20s their 30s mm. their teens it, it gives me hope for the future and it makes me feel like wow when i'm not here they're you know they're going to be good people here taking yeah. care of things it, it's really cool yeah ria i agree with you yeah. completely yeah <laughs> Um, so I guess for our, um, for our last question, as we, this is, it seems like it's just like flown by one hour, but here we are. Um, I know it's like, let's just keep going. Um, so, uh, Keiko asked, and I think, I think this is a really interesting question. I also would like to hear your answers to it. Um, you know, Keiko was really, um, feeling the emotions that you were speaking about, John, with like being, you know, radical, like just, you know, yeah. Get, uh, get it out of the way. Um, but then he says, I want to go against everything and, and, and not follow the books, but is there a point at which I should conform? And I think that's an, I think that's an, that's a question that I think is really present here because there are so many pressures for, for filmmakers to conform to these systems in order to write, like sell your film to Netflix, like get your yeah. distribution, like make sure it circulates, you know? And at what point do you conform or do you never conform? And just, you know, it's a question. I'm interested to hear what you all have to say. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I teach and I teach in a film department and, um, you know, the film department is, is dominated by narrative production and has a lot of different kinds of sort of advice that's sort of passed down through people who work in the industry. And, you know, your short film should be this long, your da da da, should, you should do this if you're doing, you know, if you want to do episodic TV, you do this, da da da, which I'm not, I don't know anything about it. I, there's my colleagues do, I don't know anything about episodic TV. But um, anyway, uh, and sometimes I feel like it's such an individual question, right? Because um, you may want to, um, you have something really specific that you grapple with in your, in your, what you want to communicate and your expression. And who am I to tell you, you know, no one's going to like this unless you do it like this, or you won't get entrance way. You know, there are certain rules of thumb and then there's always these exceptions. And so, so I told a student recently, you know, like, okay, well, if you don't want to cut that down, you know, do you, you know, you can think of it as like, I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to submit it as this, you know, whatever odd length feet, uh, short film. And, but that's the risk I'm taking. I want to take it because I believe in this vision and that's just what I want to push against. So, you know, like there is, it, it's just a hard thing to say, right? It, mm -hmm. And it depends on how quickly and what you want, what you're facing, you know, what, what kind of income you can, you know, some people feel like it's worth it for me to get my foot in the door so I can have a career like this, blah, blah, blah. Mm. It's hard and, and, you know, it's not an easy economy and, but I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to say. Yeah. John, also yeah. hard to say or? Hard to say. And I mean, it, it's, it's a real balance because obviously it's, 
expression, it's art. You've got to do it your way, say what you want. But it's you're also interacting with the whole world out there through distribution, through getting your movie out, to making business deals. And that's where it becomes purely collaborative, where you're working with other people, with other organizations, other entities out there. So yeah, it, it's a really hard balance to find. And for me personally, what I've had to do is keep my ego in check. Sometimes it's great to have a huge out of control ego, i.e. maybe you're coming up with ideas for your movie and you've got to, you know, it's never been said before. It's never been said this way before. No one's ever said it this way before. You've got to stick to your, uh, stick to your guns and do it your way and have enough faith in yourself that this is a good idea. On the other hand, you're dealing with experts out there in distribution and they're telling, giving you advice. And if your ego comes in too large, you might not listen to the best advice. You might burn bridges. You might burn a bridge with a huge producer. So yeah, it becomes a balance. And the way I try to negotiate it is I look at these movies as children. I, I don't have any kids, but in a certain sense, all of my movies are kids of mine. And on one hand, you want to instill these movies with your own consciousness. You want, you want to mold them in a certain way. On the other hand, these movies have to go out into the world and they've got to learn the rules of the world and negotiate in the world apart from me. So uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a balance of like knowing when to let go and let other people maybe give you advice and also knowing when to cut off that advice and to stick to your own guns. It's, it's a really, really hard one. I feel like I'm still learning this every day, but yeah, it's sometimes you've really got to stick to your guns. And I think artistically and creatively, that's where you stick to your guns. You're insular, you're really making your movie. And when the movie's done and it's time to get it out into the world, doing the marketing, maybe business, for me at least, that's where I've got to be a little more flexible and open to other people's ideas and input. And mm. to sort of maybe even take a back seat at times and say, I, I don't know how to distribute this movie. I'm going to let someone else do it for me, you know? Mm. Yeah, great. No, thank you. Um, so I guess we've... We've come, we've, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A queue and we've come to the end of our hour. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you all would like to leave us with. Any, any final words, any, 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 I don't know, mantras, haikus, I don't know. Wow, wow, this is, yeah, this is the moment, right? <laughs> this is the moment, it's, it's arrived, moment. it's oh. arrived. <laughs> uh, right, I'm, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna put something out there. It might sound totally stupid, new agey. What, what did you say earlier? Radically optimistic. That is but, that's uh, where it's at. <laughs> yeah, maybe we need a tiny bit of radical optimism now, but really, you know, we're all feeling what's going on. We're all aware of what's going on. How, how big it is. How important it is. How heart wrenching it is. How it brings tears to our eyes. It's. And it's, you know, you start asking questions, how did we get here? I had so much hope three years ago. I had so much hope 15 years ago. How did we, how the hell did we get here? How did this happen? And my, my only words out there is, you know, what do they say? It's always darkest before the dawn and, or you've got to hit rock bottom before you come up. And I'm not just keeping my fingers crossed, hoping for it to get better. But sometimes when it is this bleak, when it is this bad, it's almost like a certain point that you bounce back from. And that's what I'm hoping for society, for humans. And again, for that internal struggle, I think we've all got to face, which is looking at our lives, looking at ourselves. And even if you don't want to go out there and protest, you don't want to make a statement, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do that, you're afraid to go out your front door, maybe there are little adjustments you can make in your life in your consciousness, in your thinking, in your attitude. And these might be the revolution that'll shake, shake up the world, shake mm. up your world, and in turn, this will resonate and shake up the whole world, shake up your community. So yeah, you know, we, as powerless as we feel, as hopeless and bleak as it is, we, we all do have some power and we do have the ability to make things better with our own internal revolutions, you know? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would build off of that and, and, uh, and second that, that it is, it, I think it, that it's really important to look within and it's really important to face the ugly stuff that's within all of us and to 
figure out how to we we do have the power we do we are empowered and and we can change things within us and and bring that outside to the world and also that um uh, that art is not removed from this that art has a place in this and, and um yeah. That, that art can affect the way we think and raise consciousness. Um, yes. And that, you know, what's happening outside right now is, you know, is something that has been really difficult to shift for a long time. I mean, in 1992, you know, I brought that up, that story earlier, and here we are, it's, it's very similar, but this time I think yeah. it's a much more unified kind of, it's becoming a much more unified and global, and, you know, we're, there's a lot of people on board right now yeah so it's ugly but it's it sometimes some things have to come down before things will change so yeah yeah yeah, yeah and just everyone be safe stay sane i think that's the biggest battle stay sane yeah take mm. care of your loved ones just just be safe protect yourselves and really protect this thing because it, it you know we're all in this together and we've got to we've got to hold our shit together right now through these hard times so that you know we can just keep doing the good work Mm. You've done the good work. Thank you both so much. This has been like, this is thank amazing. You. Thank yeah, you I so am. much. Thank you. And Maybe thank you, welcome. all of our participants. Uh, thank hey, you. thanks, everyone. All right. Everybody, thanks. yeah. Thanks okay. Take care. Yeah. Bye. All right. Take care. <laughs> Talk soon, okay? Okay. Bye. Okay. <laughs>